Last time we saw that given a representation of SU2, R from SU2 to GLV, where V is a complex vector space, there is a decomposition of V as a direct sum from J equals one to N of VJ, where each VJ is one dimensional, such that if I pick a basis vector from each of these lines VJ and use that basis to write the matrix R e to the i theta, 0, 0, e to the minus i theta, I get the diagonal matrix whose entries are e to the i m1 theta down to e to the i m n theta. And these numbers m1 up to m n are integers called the weights. So this is called the weight space decomposition of our representation. And this is not a decomposition of the representation into sub-representations for SU2, but it is a decomposition of the uh, action of this subgroup isomorphic to U1. So I want to start by just seeing what this means on the level of Lie algebras. So um, R of e to the i theta, e to the minus i theta, that's just R of exp uh, theta times i zero zero minus i. And using our formula for R star, the map on Lie algebras, this is exp of theta times r star of i zero zero minus i. So what we're saying is um, basically r star of i zero zero minus i is the diagonal matrix you get by taking the logarithms of this matrix. In other words, i m one down to i m n and I'm just leaving out the factor of theta from both sides. Okay so in other words we know one of the matrices in our Lie algebra where it goes under this uh, Lie algebra homomorphism little su2 to little glv. So we know where i minus i diagonal matrix goes. But there are other matrices right? Little su2 is the set of matrices i x y plus i z minus y plus i z minus i x where x y and z are real numbers and all i'm telling you is where this um, x variable goes basically there's still the y and the z variables to worry about so what matrices are they going to map to well let's see so Let's, let's pick a basis for SU2 called sigma1, sigma2, and sigma3. So sigma1 is going to be this uh, i minus i on the diagonal. Sigma2 is going to be the thing corresponding to the y variable, so 0, 1, minus 1, 0. And sigma3 is going to be i, i on the off diagonal corresponding to the z variable. So if you're a physicist, you may have seen these matrices before. They're called the Pauli matrices. Uh, sometimes they have different factors of I and whatnot, but these are basically the Pauli matrices. So I've told you what is R star of sigma one. And the question is what, what are R star of sigma two and R star of sigma three? It turns out that it's much easier to answer the following question. So instead of using these matrices, we're going to use X, which is a half sigma two minus I sigma three, and Y, which is minus a half sigma two plus I sigma three. So if you figure out what this means, it turns out to be 0, 1, 0, 0, and y turns out to be 0, 0, 1, 0. Now the problem is these correspond to imaginary or complex values of y and z. And we're only allowed to take real values of y and z. 
Uh, so these don't actually live in SU2 at all. X and Y do not live in little SU2. Instead, they live in the complexification of SU2, which is just a fancy way of saying, I allow X, Y, and Z to be complex numbers. And the way to denote that is you put a tensor sign and a C after it. That's the complexification. Now, we've actually come across X and Y before when we looked at the uh, Lie algebra little sl2c. So X and Y live in little sl2c. They are trace-free two by two matrices. And actually, uh, the other matrix we looked at, I minus I, so sigma one, is just I times the matrix H that we introduced, which H was uh, one minus one on the diagonal. So it turns out this complexification is little sl2c. In other words, anything inside little sl2c can be written as a complex combination of sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, and vice versa. Anything in little su2 complexified can be written as a combination of xy and h. Okay, is this any good? Does this actually help us? Well, yes, because if we have a homomorphism of Lie algebras from little su2 to glv, where V is a complex vector space, then we get for free a homomorphism from the complexification of little SL2, uh, sorry, SU2 uh, to the same vector space, GLV. So I'm going to write this as R star superscript C. Um, so this is just, this is nothing complicated. All I'm saying is that, you know, if sigma one goes to some matrix, then I sigma one will go to I times that matrix. And whereas we didn't know what I meant before taking complexification on the left, we do now. We already knew what multiplication by I meant for GLV. So we don't need to do anything to the right hand side. And what we get is a complex linear map. So this first guy was just real linear. We were only allowed to multiply things on the left-hand side by real numbers, but now we can multiply by complex numbers. So there's nothing nothing particularly uh, deep about this. I'm just allowing myself to use complex numbers here. Okay, so what I'm gonna give you is a lemma which describes how X and Y act in this representation. So I need a bit of notation first. We're going to write WM for the weight space with weight M. In other words, it's the sum of all the complex lines VJ such that the corresponding weight MJ equals M, some fixed M. For example, if we take this representation, SIM2 of the standard representation, then remember there was a weight space with weight minus two, a weight space with weight zero, and a weight space with weight two. Then we're gonna have uh, W minus two will be that weight space, W zero will be this weight space, and sorry, yeah, W two will be this weight space. So it's just the VJs, the index here, the J, didn't really correspond to anything we want to know about, whereas the M corresponds to the weight that we want to know about here. So we're just grouping together the VJs into uh, collections that have the same weight. So here's the claim. First of all, R star H acts on WM as the matrix M times the identity. In other words, if V is in WM, it's a weight vector with weight M, then R star H V equals M V. B, R star X sends W M to W M plus two. In other words, if V is in the weight space W M, then R star X V is in the weight space W M plus two. And similarly for Y, R star Y sends WM to WM minus two. 
So in terms of this picture up here, um, I'll draw it a bit bigger down here. We know that H will send W0 to W0. It'll actually multiply everything by zero, so it'll act trivially there. It'll send everything in W2 to itself with a factor of two, and everything in W minus two to itself with a factor of two. X will move everything in W minus two over to W0, everything in W0 over to W2, and everything in W2 will go to W4, but W4 is zero in this example, so it'll just uh, it'll go to zero. And Y uh, goes from W2 to W0 and from W0 to W minus two. So that's a picture of the statement of this lemma. So when I said that the other elements of SU2, the off-diagonal elements will mix up the weight spaces, this is what I meant. They mix it up in a very precise way. And you can see that if you worked with sigma two and sigma three, because they're combinations of X and Y, the, the diagram would be messy. You know, sigma two would send uh, W zero to the left and to the right with some factors of I. So this is much clearer. Okay, let's prove the lemma. First of all, A, we've already proved because remember, sigma one is I H. So R star sigma one equals um, I times R star H. But this was the diagonal matrix uh, I M one down to I M N. So in other words, R star H is just the diagonal matrix with M's on the diagonal, M one up to M N. And then when we group all the weight spaces with the same weight together and just restrict to those, we only pick up the diagonal entries with an M. So R star H restricted to WM is then just the diagonal matrix with M's in the diagonal. Okay, what about X? I'm gonna do X and I'm gonna leave Y as an exercise for you. So the claim is that if V is in WM, then uh, R star X V is in WM plus two. That's what we need to prove. What does this condition mean? Well, V is in WM if and only if um, it's got weight M. So in other words, H acts as R star H V equals M V. And what we want to prove is that um, R star H of this vector, R star X V, is in the weight space with weight M plus two, so equals M plus two R star X V. In other words, we want to show R star X V is an eigenvector of R star H with eigenvalue M plus two. Well, unfortunately, we can't evaluate R star H, R star X very easily. What we could evaluate would be R star X of R star H V. Because this equals R star X of M V. And we can just bring the M out the front and this would be M times R star X V. Okay, but we can't just send the H past the X because these two guys don't commute. Now remember, when we looked at the Lie algebra little sl2c, we discovered that H bracket X equals two X. So if we apply R star to both sides, what we get is R star of the bracket H bracket X equals two R star X. But we can expand this bracket because R star is a Lie algebra homomorphism, so we get R star H bracket R star X. In other words, this is R star H, R star X minus R star X, R star H. And now if we just apply 
um, both sides to V, what we get is uh, 2 R star X V equals R star H R star X V minus R star X R star H V. This guy, this last guy we've computed, this is equal to M R star X V. And this over here is 2 times R star X V. This A, R star H R star X V is what we want. So rearranging, we get exactly what we wanted. R star H R star X V equals M plus 2 R star X V. So I told you this equation was going to be important. This H bracket X equals 2X. This is the first instance where it becomes important. It's going to come up again and again. Okay, so it's going to be an exercise for you to check part C of the lemma, which is the, the corresponding statement for R star Y.